Molly Gerver joins us. Molly, really good to have you on the programme. It seems a one-way ticket is central to this new policy. Who is it targeting? So, according to Home Secretary Priti Patel, it's only targeting those who are not fleeing persecution and who are arriving without a visa, so illegally via the English Channel. Uh, but in practice, it actually targets far more individuals. So under the policy, an individual can be immediately flown to, so excuse me, under the policy, an individual could be immediately brought to Heathrow Airport and flown to Kigali International Airport in Rwanda before they have the opportunity to prove that they are fleeing persecution. So if a woman is a teacher in Afghanistan and she's forced to flee the Taliban, arrive in the UK via a boat, she can be immediately transferred to Rwanda before she has the opportunity to prove that she is a refugee. And Patel herself said that the vast majority of those who arrive by boats will be eligible for resettlement to Rwanda and unable to remain in the UK. And we know that the majority of those who arrive by boats are in fact refugees according to home office statistics. So the target is officially those who are not refugees, but in practice, the majority who will be resettled will be fleeing persecution and so refugees. Yeah. How much does it follow the Australian model, even listening to Boris Johnson's language tonight, the scheme he says was needed to save countless lives from making dangerous crossings? It really does echo of the Australian Prime Minister announcing the same policy here. Yeah, so I mean, it's openly inspired by the Australian policy of trying to deter individuals from arriving in the UK, just as Australia tried to deter individuals from arriving onto Australian territory. And some of the limitations of the policy in the UK echo the limitations of the UK policy. So for one, there's very little accountability. There's very little transparency of what will happen to refugees after they arrive in Rwanda, just as refugees who were forced to live in Nauru were often unable to communicate the conditions, were unable to communicate their lack of medical care, their lack of access to sufficient nutrients, access to education. Similarly, the refugees who will be resettled to Rwanda will, unable, will likely be unable to communicate what the conditions are actually like in Rwanda. So some of the secrecy that we see in the Australian policy is also seen in this particular policy. So in many ways, it's it's similar to in just sending out this very strong deterrent message to all migrants to a degree. And I mean, we know the UK is, is the destination many migrants want to go to. Uh, it's, you know, they move heaven and earth to try and get to the UK. So the UK is overwhelmed in many respects. Well, the vast, vast majority of refugees do not want to arrive in the UK and don't try to arrive in the UK and, quite frankly, don't have the means to even pay a smuggler to reach the UK. It's only an extremely, extremely small percentage of all refugees who have the means and ability and desire to reach the UK. And of the small number who do arrive, they're not able to, under the proposed policy, access the means of remaining in the UK. But there is a point to be made that well, maybe there needs to be some sort of deterrence policy, some sort of way of decreasing the number of refugees who arrive in case the UK becomes overwhelmed. And in particular, the UK does want to prevent people smuggling. They feel that if more refugees are encouraged to arrive in the UK, they're going to be paying smugglers and perhaps die on the English Channel. But in practice, the policy will unlikely have that effect. Uh, so for one, we know that refugees who have been resettled to Rwanda in the past under, under, under other countries' policies have been unable to get asylum in Rwanda and have attempted to pay smugglers to once again reach Europe. Uh, so for example, Israel actually had a policy of resettling Eritrean and Sudanese refugees to Rwanda. Roughly 4,000 were required to move to Rwanda between 2014 and 2017. And the vast majority of those did not obtain asylum in Rwanda. They couldn't access sufficient nutrients. They were homeless or unable to leave an enclosed building. Of those who had the means to leave, they paid smugglers to go to other African countries and, in fact, Europe. So a lot of these offshore detention centers actually encourage refugees to put even more money in paying smugglers. So it has the opposite effect 
of what is desired. Interesting. You know, as I mentioned at the start, uh, this issue, this camp, this, this policy featured again during the election campaign in Australia today, this turning back the boats and offshore settlement. What, in your view, should voters understand about these policies, the cost, the implications? Yeah, so voters should be thinking about four central factors when deciding whether they support these policies. So one is whether there's transparency. So if the government is proposing a offshore detention center, but journalists will be unable to access the center and refugees won't have the means of even calling journalists or friends and family in Australia to tell people what's happening, then that's a good reason not to support that policy. And this is true both in the Rwandan policy that the UK is proposing. And it's true in Australia as well when it comes to offshore detention centers. So every Australian citizen should have a right to know what's happening to refugees and asylum seekers and which refugees and asylum seekers are in fact being detained. So transparency, that is one key factor. Another is accountability. So if an asylum seeker is, for example, raped in detention center, we need to know who is responsible for that happening. If an asylum seeker is unable to access basic medical care, we need to be able to say this person is responsible and this needs to change. We need to have people accountable. If it's private guards who are in charge of the conditions of refugees and these private guards are working for corporations that are not accountable to Australian citizens, that's lack of accountability. Third, just basic humanity. I think nearly everybody agrees that if asylum seekers are unable to apply for refugee status, they're unable to prove that they're refugees and get protection in Australia, and then are detained, cannot leave detention centers so they're immobile, can't access sufficient medical care or education, take part in self-harm because of the extreme trauma they're experiencing as a result of living in an enclosed space. That's inhumane, and that's a reason not to support that policy. Mm. And finally, just costs. A reason government tend to deter refugees from arriving is that they're worried that if too many refugees and asylum seekers arrive, that will place a strain on the economy of the country. It will mean many Australian citizens or British citizens will be unable to find sufficient employment themselves. But if it costs the government over a million dollars to detain each refugee and asylum seeker, those costs far outweigh the costs that Australian citizens would bear if they were to just give refugees asylum, partly because the costs would just be lower. There'd be no need to pay guards to stare at refugees and make sure they don't leave. And partly because refugees themselves would pay taxes, which would contribute to their access to necessities. So those are the main things we should care about. Transparency, knowing what the government's doing, accountability, knowing who is responsible, humanity, making sure people have the basic necessities at the very least, and costs. Molly, uh, very interesting uh, points you make and uh, fascinating to see this policy as it's been unveiled. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much.